and through this lecture for breaking down uh, notions of witnessing as a verb. So I thought I could provide that for you guys. So here are some ways that we generally talk about the concept of witness. We talk about a noun, the witness. We talk about a verb, to witness. And there are three specific contexts where the word comes up quite a bit. Uh, the first one would be the legal context, like the witness stand, right? The next one would be a, a trauma context, like uh, you witnessed uh, a war, you witnessed a horror. And then actually, uh, it's a common concept in theater and performance, uh, the idea that the audience is a witness and bears witness to things. So we can think about witnesses in terms of Peep, in terms of action, who's controlling the action, who's being controlled by the action, and who's stepping aside from the action. So in terms of controlling action, in law we tend to speak about perpetrators, right? In theater, we would talk, we would talk in terms of the, the writer, or film too, the writer, the director. They're controlling what's happening. Then when we talk about who's controlled the, by the action, in law, we would call them victims. In theater, we could call them actors, right? Because they're controlled by the playwrights and the director's intentions. Actors don't go do their own thing. They do what they're directed to do. You might be going, why are we talking about theater? We'll get there. And then, of course, there are the bystanders, and in law, we might talk about things like an accessory to a crime, right? So if I tell you this thing and you don't do anything, just because I told you and now you know, if you choose not to do something, you are actually possibly legally at, at risk. And in law, uh, sorry, in theater, we call this the audience, right? The audience has a choice. They can stay and watch, they can leave, they can intervene. There's lots of things that an audience can do that people forget. Uh, I was going to show you guys uh, this video of a famous performance piece, uh, but then I realized it's such a short video that it's, it, in some ways, it's conceptual art, so it's better described. Anybody know the name Chris Burden? Yeah, <laughs> I knew this guy would, the filmmaker. Yeah. So Chris Burden is a performance artist. He died recently. and. Um, He's sort of, he's known for a lot of different things, but probably his most famous one is a piece called Shoot, where he, it was the 70s, I believe, this is right after Vietnam, he um, had a friend shoot him as performance. And it's a fascinating story, and there's lots to unravel in all of that, but uh, the main thing he was interested in was the audience, what, what they were going to do. And I, a long time ago, had done a, a performance piece this is in a different life. Um, but it involved uh, slapping, physically hitting another person, and them hitting me, and then me hitting myself, and then all this art school. So, uh, <laughs> but the, the main point of it was the conversation that followed, because every person was like, I felt really manipulated by that. And I was like, that makes sense. Why didn't you leave? And they were like, but, uh, uh, oh, right? So, speaking of, so there's a couple of, um, anybody not aware of who this person is? In case you don't know, uh, this is a uh, woman named uh, Christine Blasey Ford, like her sign says. She is a uh, neuroscientist. Uh, she is uh, a specialist in trauma studies, and she also just testified uh, at the Supreme Court hearing for uh, Brett Kavanaugh in the United States, um, uh, making an allegation that he had sexually assaulted her at uh, a party when they were young. So uh, this is a sort of an interesting example of the three levels of witnessing here. We have uh, somebody recounting uh, a trauma who actually is a trauma specialist. We have a legal 
um, concern for rule of law to prevail so that people aren't just sort of thrown in willy-nilly uh, into um, the dustbin just because somebody alleges that they did something. And we have and, and we have a question of what the character is of somebody who's going to sit on the Supreme Court of the United States, which is a lifetime appointment, and with very critical uh, bills and laws up for discussion. And then the third thing we have is uh, an audience. We have the audience of the people in the gallery, as you can see behind her. We have the audience of the people who were watching the testimony on television. We have a worldwide audience. This, this is circulating for a bunch of different reasons to a bunch of different people. So this is a very interesting moment to ask who is being cast as the perpetrator? Is it Brett Kavanaugh, who is allegedly an assailant? Is it Dr. Ford, who is allegedly assassinating character, right? So you have these different versions of who's the victim, who's the, who's the uh, perpetrator, and then, of course, who's the bystanders? Uh, the different senators have to vote whether they're going to confirm or not, so then their action is, is required. But then those politicians are actually supposed to be working for the citizens. So then the question is, are you contacting those politicians? And then Politicians represent particular constituencies in particular areas. So then you have people saying, well, I would, but she doesn't represent me, you know, geographically. So these are all kinds of things at play in, in this particular case. So uh, this leads us to the notion of bystanders. So there's two types of bystanders, according to our reading. Uh, the first would be the type one, would be somebody who is passive in the face of individual mistreatment. You see somebody, um, somebody alleges that they were uh, attacked and you don't do anything, or, or you watch somebody attacked and you don't do anything. There's two variations on this. There's what they call the internal bystander and the external bystander. The internal bystander is somebody who has a stake in the culture in which something is transpiring, right? Um, that could be uh, because of peer pressure. That could be because um, they later get conscripted into it. Let's say they don't rape the person, but they lock the door so that somebody can rape, right? So there's these elements that, that can kind of build up. This is... Um, this was something that people like Hannah Arendt uh, spent a lot of time thinking about in Nazi Germany. Uh, in her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, she spent a lot of time trying to think about, like, the term she uses is the banality of evil. What she expected to meet, when she met Eichmann, she expected to meet this horrendous individual, and she met this kind of mild-mannered dude. And what she sort of learned was that these these issues start incrementally and slowly, and decisions to act or not act are actually micro decisions. They're not big, epic decisions. I mean, there probably are some people who are like Dr. Evil and like, whoa, you know, but most people have a, a complicated story about how they wound up doing or not doing something. Then there's the external bystander, and the external bystander is somebody who, um, looks at something that goes on but goes, this isn't my culture, so I don't really know how to intervene here. Like, maybe that's just what they do. Now, there is, I don't know if this is the case in Australia, but there is a, a long history of research into police intervention into domestic disputes where uh, they will under-involve themselves in disputes among couples of color because the mentality, and they tend to be white officers, uh, the, the mentality is that, that that's just what they do. They fight a lot, right? So the feeling is like they can't read the situation where if it was a white couple, they'd be like, okay, no, this is, this isn't, this is too much. So sometimes we don't intervene in a situation because we don't feel like we have the, the, the context 
to step in. And many of us have probably seen this when you're talking about parents yelling at children in public, right? Like, there's a point where you're like, ah, uh, uh, should I say something, uh, right? And this is exactly what's at play. There's a type two bystander, and the type two bystander is not about, um, it, it's not a conversation about individual suffering, it's about social suffering, like the big, you know, suffering capital S, like hunger, war, that sort of thing. And the reasons for passivity they give in this one are things like, uh, they say acquisitiveness, basically means like you only care about your money. That's not a nice way to say it. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Overt focus on self-interest, like somebody going, well, I don't really understand how this applies to me. Um, ideological beliefs in things like individual self-determination, right, where you're like, um, I've had this happen myself. If I see somebody uh, asking for money on the street and they are older or they seem disabled or they are female, I'll have one read. And if they're a particular age and a particular race and a particular gender in a particular kind of body, my first instinct will be like, why don't you, dude, get a job? Which is really out of line because I actually have no idea what's going on with them in terms of neurodiversity, in terms of, like, I don't know. But my impulse, right, is to uh, jump to an ideological belief that certain people should pull it together. Doesn't make it right, makes it real. All right. Most people are overwhelmed with immediate issues of the day. There's lots of studies that say, controlled studies that say, like, the issue is if somebody's 10 minutes late for something, that will be the difference between whether they stop to help somebody who's, like, been shot, which is kind of amazing, but we've all been late, and we all know what that's about. Then there's, um, then there's things like ideological beliefs like loyalty to superiors or, you know, like the doctor's got to be right, even if the doctor's, say, sexually abusing somebody, like, you know, like those sorts of ideas, um, or patriotism. And then there's processes, but we're going to go a lot about, this is, we talk a lot about this with the idea of overload and stuff uh, with the distant suffering piece, so I'm going to skip it for right this second. So we might only have time for this little last bit, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the rest next time, I promise. But I want you to think in terms of uh, these modes of witnessing, because this wasn't in the original piece that I gave you. So, But I, I think it's really helpful for people that are doing presentations. So this piece uh, on the theater thing talks about three different kinds of witnessing. The first is primary witnessing. That's firsthand account. Something happened to you. When something happens to you, the brain unless you're blind, tends to process it as a kind of um, visual experience. Also, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a phenomenological experience. You feel it in your body, you know, nausea, that kind of stuff. And that's how you communicate it. You tend to communicate it in terms of almost cinematic images rather than a very logical narrative. Secondary witnessing is when you learn about something because somebody told you that it happened to them. And that tends to be through language, through narrative. Tertiary witnessing, which is, is what media makers do, unless they're, you know, news reporters. Tertiary witnessing is third-hand experience of something or someone via reenactment. So, that tends to be performative. So you might say, oh, in that movie I saw, the actor playing Hitler said this to the actor playing uh, Ava Braun, and then they said this, right? So it's, you're showing something that happened, but everybody knows that the players are not real, that this is not real, that, right? There's, there's a lot of levels. So uh, this short film, which I don't have time to screen today, but, um, the link is there, and I might show it first thing next time. It's really cool. It's actually by Catherine Millard. Anybody take a class with Cal Catherine Millard here? She is a uh, filmmaker. She teaches film here. And uh, there was a very cool project at Macquarie where they were charged with getting film, going to archives of all kinds of different places, scientists, this and that, and pulling out 
video footage, video recording of stuff that happened, and then making short documentaries where they kind of rethought elements of history. And this particular one uh, deals with the Milgram experiment, which we have looked at a lot. Those were the people who came in and were shocked. You had to give an electric shock to somebody else. In this particular piece, she went into the archives and she found transcripts from three women who were asked to give the electric shock who said no, not doing it. They quit in the middle of the experiment. Now, other people quit in the middle of the experiment, but what makes these three women unique is that there was a long um, debrief session. So there was, you heard their side of it. You heard what they were thinking, which we never have seen in any of the representations that we've seen. We've seen a bunch of different representations of the Milgram experiment now. And never did we hear out of the mouth of the people who made the decisions, right? We've only seen the kind of God's eye view. So one of the things that's interesting uh, about this is that Catherine decided to take the transcript, get actors, this woman who looks like Sybil Shepherd, um, and reenact the scenes. So they're not the actual people. Those people are dead, probably. But they are the actual words from the transcripts. And we know that filmmakers make different choices with cameras and positions and the way they set up and what they include and what they leave out. And this is a great way to talk about tertiary witnessing. So one of the things that's in this film is, as I said, the perspectives of these women. And interestingly, one of the things that's not in the film is a piece of information that I only learned reading the YouTube comments. I think they kind of mention it, like they th it's like a throw off in the, in, in the film, but they don't ever go into it. And it is this, check this out for confirmation bias. The scientists decided, now this experiment where you are electrocuting people and they're screaming, you're, I, ha I have a heart condition, right? Like this is traumatizing stuff. The scientists decided that after each uh, end of the experiment, the person playing the shocked person, the actor, would come out and be like, I'm okay, I'm here, right? And then everybody would be like, oh, okay, and then, and then they'd go along their way. But they decided that for the women, and only the women, they needed to have a debrief session where they let the women talk about their feelings about having <laughs> been asked to electrocute a human being. Apparently, men didn't need to process. They were good to go. So as a result, we have no transcripts from the men. I know, I saw your eyebrows go up. That's what I said. So how much of this becomes a self-perpetuating fantasy that men don't have very complex emotional responses to things like harming other people? when you never even gave them the opportunity to speak their words. And how much of the idea that women are overly sensitive is due to the fact that they're the ones that are hyper-focused on, but only in this way. Now, what's so interesting about this transcript is that the, the investigators keep trying to reframe the women's language to make it about like their feelings. So they were like, so what made you like nervous and upset? And the one woman is, she's like German. The one woman is like, I wasn't nervous. I was mad. I was pissed off at you. I thought you were gonna give this guy a heart attack. I'm a registered nurse. I was gonna burn this place down. And he's like, right, but what part like got you nervous and upset? She's like, you're not listening to me. I'm not nervous, I'm angry. So this was a really fascinating moment in framing, isn't it? And if I had to ask which representation of this experiment was more real in terms of real news, I guess maybe some of the earlier stuff we saw with the actual footage of the actual human beings doing that stuff. But there's a real and then there's a reality. 
and there can be multiple realities, right? So this is what you came here to do. This is what you came to, to school to do. You want to figure out how to change the world? This is, there's nothing else. This is all we're selling. The most powerful question you can ask as a thinker, as a citizen, as a media maker especially, is what else could this be? And then show people. To do those two things, any moron can show the world what already, what, what already is. Like, you know, here's your editing software, go. Most people can't conceptualize what the world could be. And if they can conceptualize it, they don't have the skills to persuade somebody else to buy in. Only you guys have that. And that's what makes what we do matter. And so the next time somebody asks you, what are you going to do with a media degree? Look them right in the eye and go, I'm going to change the world. What are you going to do? Mic drop. I'm done with this for the day. <laughs> we'll pick up the rest next time. Seminars or anything like that? the one I just went to, you're going to hear a fair amount of this stuff repeated so by, by your fellow students. So I'm going to blow through this New York style, which means like 10 minutes tops, and then we'll get into today. But I want to make sure that it's on audio for anybody who is, um, who, who is sort of craving closure with last week's uh, lecture. So we talked about a whole bunch of different acts of, we talked about the concept of the witness and the concept of the bystander. We also talked about the um, different kinds of uh, witnessing that you can engage in. And I mentioned primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary being firsthand, so a firsthand account of something. Uh, secondary being an account that you heard from someone else. And tertiary being a reenactment of some sort. And um, in, that could be anything from a reconstruction to um, a narrativization for a film to even something like behind the scenes making a blank, right? There's, it's, it's a re, it's, it's a revisualization, a reconstruction of memory. And I think each one of these has their own use value. We talked yes, uh, last time about this um, film, which I absolutely encourage you to take a look at. It's like 13 minutes, uh, about the, uh, the women from the Milgram experiment who uh, resisted. And by the way, 50% of the people in the experiment who resisted were, it, it was like a 50-50 gender split. Half were men, half were women. But again, we only have the transcripts from the women because they were determined to be the ones who needed decompressing. And today I want to mention uh, the concept of false witnessing. I want to mention it because it also ties into some of the stuff that we are going to be talking about for this week. So we've been speaking, we started off the semester, if you will recall, uh, around the notion of um, authenticity and truth and, and how that becomes commodified in the terms of, uh, and, and, and aestheticized in, the term, in terms of um, brand identity and branding policies and brand aesthetics. And I was talking to my uh, grad students today and they were asking me about authenticity in terms of they have a project where they have to put together an influencer's portfolio, and they were like, well, how authentic should I be? And I, and I was like, I think that y we need to break this down in, in a bunch of different categories. So I would say there is, a, there is a phenomenological and psychological concept of authenticity that we kind of all have. You can call it 
acting in integrity, um, being not being fake, whatever you want to call that. And it's something that you're always negotiating between, you know, your ego and your id. You, you know, your id might want to go crazy. Your super ego is going, you know, a nice person or a kind person or a decent person doesn't do that, and your ego's, you know, negotiating. And where where you find a kind of a sweet spot or an equilibrium, that's how you start to feel like yourself, like authentic, like at peace. Then there's an organizational sense of authenticity, and I, I think that that is different. I think it's different for groups. I think it's different for corporations. I think, you know, depending on the organization, it works differently. And that comes from the idea that if we are each being absolutely authentically ourselves, then it would be very difficult to talk about what this group is as some sort of coherent entity. So, for instance, if I say, well, women like this, and then I proceed to speak very idiosyncratically about my life, you know, women would prefer to live with their cat, ideally a rescued street cat, and, da -da -da -da, and, and after a while, you know, women, other women would be like, not all women do that. So then you go, okay, well, maybe I'll lighten up on the cat bit. Um, women like the companion animals, or you know, you just start like sort of softening the language till you get to something that everybody can kind of agree on. And this is what happens when we when we talk about group identity of any sort. Same thing with corporate identity. Everybody at Macquarie doesn't have the exact same opinion on every single thing, and yet Macquarie needs to present itself as a particular kind of identity in order to market itself as a good within the, the Australian educational system. So, um, you know, I give a little bit, you give a little bit, we figure out where our common ground is, and then voila, there's this sort of sense of, of organizational authenticity. Then, when you move into communication, there's something I would call expressive or communicative authenticity. And uh, that has more to do with what your audience knows, expects, and anticipates as authentic behavior. So the classic example is if I am a very communicative person about my emotions, and you are a very quiet person, or, or you, and you maybe express more toward physicality than words, I might experience you as emotionally withholding if we're in a relationship together, because I want to talk. You might experience me as kind of a bullshitter, because all I do is talk. So there is this push and pull that we have when we're reading each other's signs, and we're always reading each other's signs for authenticity based on our own ideas about what constitutes a, a legitimate or, or an appropriately expressed identity. And when it gets too far afield from what we expect, particularly as a culture, then we engage in things like shame and stigmatizing, right? So the one way to think about authenticity is as a reaction rather than an action. So that begs the question, what are we reacting to? And one thing we're reacting to or anticipating is what is called in literature false witnessing. So what is false witnessing? It quickly, it's basically being declared fake in some way. And so here's the fancy term, a negative judgment made about the ethics of someone who's witnessing on behalf of another. So. Um, so maybe there's two ways. There's, there's the fake person and then there's the false witness. So the fake person seems to be dissembling or they seem to be hiding or they seem to be withdrawn or they seem to be lying, right? The fake witness seems to be doing that on behalf of someone or something else. So uh, if the company website uh, the company Facebook page for a corporation is like, we put our customers first, we love you like you're our family, we want to hear from you, and this is all over their rhetoric. But when you put a comment on Facebook, it takes five and a half years for somebody to respond. You read them as a false witness, don't you? Because you're like, yeah, you care about me. If I have uh, user testimonials and they all say, this is the best thing I've ever had, Mary W. Australia, 
and then they have some sort of generic woman's face. And you see that on, on a site like Facebook, you're kind of like, okay, this is one of those like cheesy plug and play uh, marketing blog things that this person just like used the stock photography. Like these aren't even real testimonials because who is Mary W from Australia? Like why doesn't she have a, at least a city? So, and sometimes because I'm a nerd, I will uh, reverse image those pictures of those people and they don't even, they're usually stock photograph people. So it's like they couldn't even be bothered to like go take a picture of somebody who couldn't show up in a catfish search. So when that happens, you think, I gave you my time, I gave you my attention, I was gonna give you my credit card, but you've shown me who you are by your behavior. You've shown me you are not qualified to take my money, to get my vote, to uh, convince me of something. One of the greatest critiques, and this has to do with um, perceptions of things like distance suffering, one of the greatest critiques of uh, NGOs and the way that they portray themselves worldwide is uh, NGOs tend to be staffed by well-to-do, well-educated, <laughs> largely Western or Western-educated individuals who are speaking on behalf of the poor, the downtrodden, the suffering, et cetera. And it is, it, it's getting rarer, but um, for a very long time, you never ever heard the actual voices of the people being, um, that are supposed to be assisted by these NGOs. You would hear, you'd see a picture of them, you might get a name, but you'd never get a testimonial, you wouldn't get a video, you wouldn't get, they were always objects rather than subjects or co-creators uh, co of their environment. So the, the slogan that was actually developed by sex workers around the world um, who fight for sex worker rights was nothing about us without us. If you think about every single NGO that's devoted to child sex trafficking in the world, there's quite a few of them. And there are very few individuals on the boards or in, 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 the, um, in the working structures of those NGOs who are actual people who were trafficked or are sex workers. The argument is usually that they're too young or they're too vulnerable or there's language issues so they cannot represent themselves. But the thing is, uh, many of them are representing themselves. So let me show you this one. So this is like one of my favorite, this is a red umbrella is um, sort of a universal, a global symbol for sex worker rights internationally. And uh, this is a red umbrella group and um, it says, don't talk to me about sewing machines, talk to me about workers' rights, Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers. This came from uh, a series of reports that said, uh, so a lot of these rescue, they call it the rescue industry. So a lot of the, the rescue industry operates on the idea that everybody engaged in sex work has no other opportunity, and so they're going to find them opportunities. And many of the opportunities they find, as elsewhere in poor areas of Southeast Asia, are in the garment industry in factories, in sewing factories. And uh, in many of these places, the argument goes, but my niece and my brother and my cousin work at that factory and everybody knows that the guy on the shop floor rapes the staff. So are you gonna protect me from that? Like why should I go work for that if I can get paid for having sex? And the answer is, oh, I'm sorry, that's not part of our remit. That, we, we, that's, that issue's too big for us to think about. So as long as it's cast as a, rep as a representation of saving a particular kind of victim and putting them in a better situation, everybody's available for that conversation. And when the narrative blows out, then people stop, start dropping out of the conversation. So 
that would be one type of false witnessing. When you're talking about uh, a population that you actually have never even spoken to somebody who does that. And in the case of worldwide sex work, that's, that's unforgivable as far as I'm concerned because I'd say that sex workers are some of the most internet active people there are. They have to be globally. The sex tourism industry is absolutely dependent on technology. So the idea that there's like some poor voiceless person who needs to be saved gets challenged by these sorts of narratives. Another way that we uh, can engage in false witnessing is uh, through straight up misunderstanding, misrepresentation, and fraud. So does anybody, you know, we've talked about Coney 2012 before, and we often talk about it as sort of a viral hoax, but you know, viruses don't just come out of nowhere. They people who study viruses talk in terms of vectors. They, they sort of settle places and then, you know, they propagate in certain areas. So when they did the sort of media forensics on Coney 2012, one of the vectors they found, I don't know, this is like the day for his name to come up in every single conversation, was Kanye West. And um, so this was a particular version of Kanye. You know, there's been like 13 versions of Kanye. I'd say this was like version 3.7. In this version, he uh, was saying George Bush didn't care about black people after her King Cretina and had really been seen as sort of an advocate for African Americans. And he got the Coney 2012 information from another advocate who was Russell Simmons, who uh, runs Def Jam Records and is an activist. Russell Simmons, got his information out of the horse's mouth because he met the dude who ran the campaign. What was it called? Uh, forgotten children, found children. It was something about children. You know the campaign I'm talking about, right? Invisible, thank you. Invisible children. Um, he had met at a, uh, a program called uh, Summit Series, which is kind of like a TED Talk thing. And they spent a few days together. And so, he heard the story, there was a presentation, everybody was really, you know. You meet somebody at TED, you probably don't think you should fact check them, right? You figure, I guess they're telling the truth. I mean, we have to start somewhere believing that someone's telling the truth, so this summit series is where he encountered this guy. And then he told Kanye, and then Kanye told the world. And so once Kanye told the world, that's when the whole thing went completely viral. So that's an interesting example of uh, a false witnessing. And of course, Kanye is sort of a, a specialist in false witnessing because um, that would be his entire claim about uh, Taylor Swift's fight with him, right? So he, he said, I made, what's the line? I made you famous, I made, I made that bitch famous, is that the line? Okay, so I made that bitch famous and then she comes back and says, this is not cool. And then he comes back and says, yo, we had a conversation and you told me it would be fine. And then she says, no, I didn't. So we're still in this witnessing, right? Who's, he said, he, she said, who, who saw what, who heard what, right? And then, uh, and then the next thing you know, um, because <laughs> it's 2018, um, Kim Kardashian shows up <laughs> and is like, yo, I've got a tape. So, you know, and here's, here she is on tape saying this. So if social, if, if social media, uh, there's a bunch of, we've talked before about this, there's a bunch of different types of capital in the world, right? There's fiscal capital, money. There's cultural capital, whether somebody thinks you're cool or uh, in fashion or smart or whatever, and then there is social capital, your connections with other people. The, the prime currency of social capital is reputation. If your reputation slips, it's usually because you've been established as a false witness of some sort. So in this case, Taylor gets accused of being a false witness, right? And then this and then, then the pylon comes on, right? So it's like, oh, well, she said she was authentically, you know, a uh, country folk singer when she started in rags to riches, but really she was like a rich uh, lawyer's daughter from upstate New York, right? So it, it, it just it goes on and on. 
so then if you're Taylor Swift and you have the kind of fiscal capital that Taylor Swift has, you flip that story and you say, instead of being tortured by my reputation, I'm going to make an album called Re Reputation. And then, bless, a million 17-year-olds go, you see, she totally inverted the script. And I'm like, the word is Madonna. I need you to look that up. So, but, you know, for that generation, she is Madonna. So, so this is the, the way that the discourse of false witness and authenticity are always of a piece. They're always dialoguing back and forth, back and forth. So um, we had that, we had that. And then, of course, we have things like irony, parody, mocking. And so for some people, this is funny. And for some people, what's particularly reprehensible about this is that it's a mimic of what was obviously a very painful moment for this individual. And done for laughter, which is, of course, what she said was the most traumatic element of, uh, of her memory. So um, I'm going to assume that you will be hearing a lot about the distant suffering stuff in your classes, because I heard quite a bit about it. Uh, I've got the notes here for you. I don't want to go uh, too much into this because there's a lot of, um, uh, they'll feel like a lot of overlap between what you're getting from your seminars. But, they, but the notes are here. Um, I want to say a couple quick things about this, though. The first thing is there are some very interesting turns in that piece on distant suffering. The first is the idea that um, she, she kind of pokes into a lot of truisms, a lot of cyn cynical positions that people take. The first is that all Western depiction of suffering from afar always does things like portray victims and only victims or uh, take a colonizer mentality. And those things are very true, but they're, if you look at the actual data, there's increasingly more types of coverage and types of stories where you're getting different views. Um, one of many examples of this, and, and as globalization is, is spreading, uh, you're seeing interesting reworkings of this. So the classic example to me of this would be Al Jazeera. So Al Jazeera starts with a very particular kind of uh, agenda, which is to be the Middle East version of CNN. They come out of Qatar. Um, and they are, um, rather than the satellite, I'd say their model is less satellite and more drone in how they sort of get in and around stuff. CNN would be the satellite uh, uh, metaphor of news coverage. And then they want to move. So again, I'm old enough to remember when, if you were in the States and you watched Al Jazeera coverage, you were on the CIA watch list. Because the only people watching Al Jazeera coverage were people from the Middle East or terrorist sympathizers, as, according to my government. And then a few years ago, Al Jazeera decided to rebrand themselves and go after a youth market within the US and the West. And now, if you look on Facebook and you know things like that, you'll see a lot of uh, video reporting from Al J, AJ. Well, that's Al Jazeera. And they've repositioned their mark of authenticity to be the viewer who is critical of Western policies. Sometimes, because they also have this layered identity, they sometimes wind up being the viewer who's critical of uh, Middle Eastern policies from a youth perspective. Like when they take that angle, they, they can do it. So watching them play out has been a very interesting example in of how you keep trying to reestablish your credibility as a witness and how authenticity becomes part of, of that. The other thing I wanted to talk about before we go to the next thing is um, this conversation about compassion fatigue. So 
it's funny because it's one of those things that everybody takes as a given, but the data doesn't actually definitively support it. So the argument of, about compassion fatigue is that we're so inundated with data that we just can't take it all in, and as a result, we just don't care anymore. There isn't really a lot of quantitative data that, that demonstrates that over time. Uh, it feels more axiomatic, like it feels like something that should be true, right? So in this piece, um, they're, they actually tried to figure out in terms of representation, not reception, because that's different. Different audiences receive things differently, but representation, strategies. What seems to resonate the most with people in terms of large-scale disaster coverage? And what they found were distance, scale, actuality, and re uh, re uh, relievability. And I'll just do this quickly and move on to, to today's stuff. So distance had to do both with physical proximity, emotional proximity, like whether you had had that experience before, and conceptual proximity, like could you even imagine what it would be like to be X? I'll give you a weirdly, I don't know if I ever shared this story, but I shared a lot, and it ties to shame, so that's good. Um, so I have a friend, Mia, who uh, is blind, and she works in adaptive technologies for Microsoft, but before that she was a teacher, and primary teacher, and a kid once said to her teacher's aide, um, no, to her with her teacher's aide there, Miss Lipner, do you wish you could see? And her teacher's aide said, I'm sure Miss Lipner wishes she could see. And then she tried to move the conversation along. And Mia stopped it and said, why are you sure I wish I could see? Like, have we had a conversation about this? Because I don't remember that. Also, do you, I'm, I can't see, I'm not deaf. You think I can't answer that question myself? So this was a very interesting moment. Again, nothing about us without us. She's literally standing right there. So, and this isn't because the teacher's aid is bad or, or anything, it's that it's very difficult to conceptualize something that you haven't gone through. But there are these interesting studies that show ways in. So for instance, there is this weird study that showed people who were thirsty, um, if you showed them stuff about drought, they actually responded more empathetically. Because it's almost like your mind can magnify an existing feeling, even if we've never died of thirst. We've all been thirsty. So it's interesting to think about how do we do that in terms of sexual assault or, or um, war or all, all these kinds of things that, that feel like they're hard to get your head around. Uh, Scale has to do with the idea of one versus uh, many. There's a sort of expression that goes one, two, too many. And people will give more money to something they perceive as a huger issue, disaster, but if you show them more than like one story, they get overwhelmed. It's too much. So that is always an interesting interplay. And you see it on micro lending sites, you see it on NGO sites. They have to be very careful with how many stories they tell you in a row. But they can't tell you no stories because then you won't give. Actuality is uh, a little bit related to conceptual, uh, ability to conceptualize something. It's do you think it happened? Do you think it's being blown out of proportion? Do you think, do you, think you can trust the, the, the narrators who are telling you about it? And then the last thing would be re relievability, which is a little bit narcissistic because it, it basically turns on the idea of, do you think anything you give is gonna actually help? So if you feel like you have the capacity to make a difference, and isn't that so funny, that term make a difference? Like, to whom? To yourself? If I'm telling you every penny counts, and you're telling me it doesn't seem like my penny is gonna make a difference, well. If I'm the one in struggle, shouldn't my view on that be the one that takes precedence? And yet, it doesn't. And I understand that. Could be, it, part, sometimes it's, it's a resource management issue. There's these studies, Good Samaritan studies, that show that it's not 
the person, the age, the condition that, that's being um, you know, called for for help that makes people decide to aid or not aid. The, the biggest uh, variable is how late somebody is for the next thing. Like if you're running late, it's hard to have empathy. In New York City, the train hits somebody like every three days. And, um, and they, they don't go, oh, by the way, the train hit somebody. Uh, I mean, people throw themselves in front of the tracks, all kinds of different things. And um, so when the train stops and they say, sick passenger, we know that's code for the train hit somebody. And you'd think people would be like, oh my God. But after like 30 seconds, people are like, really? You, today was a day you decided to jump in front of the train? I didn't decide to stop living. What? Right? So it's really interesting the, the vibe that comes. And I don't think it's because people are bad. I think it's because it, it, this is, uh, this is part of being human. So there's more on this, but not much. So that's good. So let me give you 15 minutes at least of this. And there's lots of here, here to look at on your own. Um, I'm talking